let's talk about leaders of Vladimir Zelensky or Vladimir Zelensky as a uh, Joe Biden called him. Um, let's talk about him because first you have a series that you've been doing that I didn't get to finish because it was taken down, I believe, on YouTube. I don't know if it is back up uh, called Agent Zelensky. Uh, so definitely you could talk about that. But also in the article that you wrote for consortium news you also talk about and maybe i'll pull up the photo that they that i don't know if you chose this or they used because it was a very uh i i think this is a great photo as well here <laughs> here's Zelensky at the summit um i think it speaks volumes for the relationship but uh, while nato may be around for a while as you said scott as you referenced Zelensky, uh, i'm a little less sure but he continues to be very vocal, even today in Brazilian media, I believe it was Globo Media. He was talking about how nothing's ever good enough if we haven't won yet. If the conflict is continuing, nothing that the West does, nothing that NATO does is good enough for us. So talk about the maybe this, this Zelensky phenomenon. What has been, what is significant about this? Because at the NATO summit, as you said, in the article, he was kind of on display. He was an internet meme. Everyone was sharing the fo the photo of him putting mops in his hand and all kinds of things because he was so lonely. But at the same time, he keeps talking. He talks. I have never. I say this all the time on the program. I really haven't seen a if if it's a if it is truly a puppet master relationship. If it is truly NATO, the United States, hold the influence. I haven't seen a puppet speak like this to its masters uh so publicly vocally so admonishingly like just very it, and it makes me wonder one how long does Zelensky really have two um yeah your take on everything that's been going on with him being front and center the face of this conflict um as it's been going along sure First of all, I, I did do a, a two-part series called Agent Zelensky. Um, I don't want to take too much credit for it. I'm the, uh, I'm the what they call the talent. Um, although I did have a, a role in uh, in conceiving it and uh, in shaping it. Uh, I was approached by an independent uh, documentary film company, and they they had the idea, and we spent many many hours on the phone uh, talking about this. We talked about who could be interviewed, etc. Um, I thought initially that I was just going to be one of the people interviewed. I thought I was just going to go up, get interviewed, and that my interview gets spliced into the uh, film. And then they uh, came back and said, no, no, we want you to host it. <laughs> and I said, well, that's a whole different ballgame. I've never done that before. Um, so I needed to be a little bit more hands-on in terms of script development and things of that nature. But, uh, you know, they, they, they did the interviews. Uh, we wrote the script. Um, and then I, I did it. And I have to say uh, the end product uh, – surprised me it was very professional very well done um and i'm very i i was a little nervous to if you to be honest uh i was i was nervous because i had done a documentary film before in shifting sands about iraq but i was the writer director producer so i i was familiar with every second of that film why it's going in why we're doing what we're doing etc and this one you sort of have to trust them I mean, you, you sit there and say, hey, I'd like you, we, you interview this person and we'll, we'll focus on this. We'll focus on that. Um, you know, and so they, they had all the pieces. But now once I did my my uh, talking head routine, um, it's over to them. And they're the ones piecing it together with the final production say. And you don't know what it's going to look like coming out. You don't know if suddenly you're going to be, you know, Mr. Propaganda or, you know, looking like a doofus or whatever. Um I have to say they did a fantastic job and I am deeply grateful for their professionalism and, and for their work. Uh, and I think it's a valuable documentary. I think what it does is it shows um, a, a different side of the story when it comes to Zelensky, you know, here in the West, we're told that he's of course, the modern day incarnation of Winston Churchill. He's Mr. Democracy. Uh, we're one of the reasons why we're doing what we're doing is we're, he is us. We're, He's over there. He's us. He's an extension of us. He's about freedom and democracy. And nothing could be further from the truth. This is not democratic leader. This is not a, um, a you know a Winston Churchill figure. He's a comedian. Um, not bad. I mean, I watched Seven of the People, entertaining uh, series. Um, 
he deserves any credit he can get out of that. But what you learn in watching that and, and then digging more is that it's so much more than a TV series. Servant of the People was information warfare. It was designed by, for on purpose to shape the minds of the Ukrainian audience, to get them to see Volodymyr Zelensky as the president of Ukraine. That was the whole purpose of it. This was an intelligence-driven operation, and the powers behind it are oligarchs controlled by British MI6. And uh, that's why it's called Agent Zelensky, because he is literally an agent of British intelligence. And then we go through in the film, making more, uh, you know, we, we back that up uh, further. But it's important to know that, that this, this is a man who is playing a role. Um, and it's a role written by others. And we know this. I mean, it's not speculation. To give you an example, one of the more glaring examples, when the conflict started early on, if you remember, there were people were saying, hey, um, you know, the United States or the British need to fly him out, get him out of uh, Ukraine, save his life. And suddenly you get this headline, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. And everybody's like, oh, man, what a dude, what a guy. Zelensky's a man, he's rocking, dude. And everybody, and suddenly he's wearing the olive green. Everybody's like, he's a warrior, he's a warrior prince, he's a Zen master, he's everything. What they didn't realize is uh, the CIA letter admitted that uh, Zelensky never said that, that it was written by a CIA officer working at the U.S. Embassy, and they released it as a Zelensky quote, but he didn't say it. And that's the reality of Zelensky. Everything he does is scripted. Everything he does is scripted, except when he goes off script. Now, why do actors go off script? You, you see this oftentimes in, in Hollywood where, you know, a guy comes in. He's brought out of nowhere. He's given a script, a role, and man, he hits it. It's his Oscar. Got his Oscar in his hand. And he's like, yeah, I'm a great actor. No, you just had one role and you read a good script. But now he comes into the next movie and they're you're gonna, and, and suddenly he, he, he wants to freelance. I'm a great actor. I'm an Oscar winning actor. I'm an artist. And um, I'm going to read it the way I want to read it. And the director's like, no. You're going to read it the way I tell you to read it because I'm in charge of this movie. And suddenly you have a fight. And what we see with Zelensky is that he starts to believe that he's actually Winston Churchill. He starts to believe that he's actually the man in charge, that he's calling the shots, that he has a say in how this happens. But he doesn't. He, 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 he's looking at the script thinking it's reality. It's not. And we've seen him go off script before, if you recall. Um, in the fall of 2022, he came to the United States. This is back when uh, Bakhmut, the big battle of Bakhmut. Remember, he went to Bakhmut, scripted moment if you ever saw it. He hands out medals, and one of the guys gives him the medal back. If you please give this to Joe Biden, he say, thank you, Joe. And so I says, I will take this to the White House. And then they have a flag, and all the brave defenders of, of uh, Bakhmut sign the flag, and they give it to him. And Please give this to Nancy Pelosi. So Zelensky comes and he gives Biden the medal and he gives Pelosi the flag and she shouts Slava Ukraina and she says his speech in Congress is the greatest speech he ever gave. But what's happening behind the scenes is Zelensky got off script. He was supposed to go there and basically make the argument for a limited amount of military equipment that Biden was going to sign in. Instead, he's like, I need F-16s, I need F-16s, I need F-16s. And the Americans are like, that ain't on the script. Why are you asking for what's not on the script? We didn't write that for you. You shouldn't be saying it. And he got slapped down, and he had to, he had to stop saying that. Well, what we're seeing right now is, uh, is, uh, is another hissy fit. The problem is this time is that Zelensky, I think, is starting to realize that the movie's not going to have a happy ending that he, he's looking at the script and he's like, wait a minute, guys. <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's like showing up for that, you know, like they used to do in Game of Thrones, you know. You show up and you go, damn it, there's a red wedding. <laughs> I'm going to die. Why didn't you tell me this? I'm going to get shot. I don't want to end this career. <laughs> and Zelensky's like, you know, hey, guys, this, this script sucks. I die here. The Ukraine loses. We can't do that. Why, why are we doing this? Why, why, why don't let's rewrite page 34 where it says you're going to give me 120 F-16s. And they're going to come in and save the day. Let's write that, guys. 
and, and the script writers and the director are like, ah, sorry, we have our ending and it is what it is. And there's nothing you can do to change it. And that's where Zelensky is right now. That's why this is so sad. So sad because the, 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 the man who would be Winston Churchill is realizing that he's just Volodymyr Zelensky. He's just an actor. He's just playing a role and he's not in control of the script. Yeah, I mean, all, and all of that is true. And it, it, I think it's always a bit shocking when he does go off script because, I mean, it's very confrontational. And you wrote in the article, too, that they're not happy with him. Where, where do you think this is going to go? I mean, you mentioned it could very well lead to his death. But in the immediate term, uh, I mean, do you, do you see him remaining in power? It just feels... It feels like there was a period earlier in the conflict when there was musical chairs in Uk- the Ukrainian government's leadership, uh, but that felt more like it was surrounding Zelensky rather than it was him in trouble. But lately, it's felt like the United States, uh, you know, uh, the major NATO countries, they're not so satisfied with him at the moment. So, so how do you see his future playing out specifically, do you think? Well, sure. I mean, look, we, we know the script's been written. Um, look what and Saudi Arabia is hosting this uh, this peace conference. And it's curious, it's a peace conference, but Russia's not invited. Um, that's okay, because Russia's not meant to be invited. It's a peace conference where they're going to take Zelensky's 10-point peace plan, and they're going to throw it out the window. That's my prediction. Because you, you, you can't go anywhere with this 10-point peace plan. So they're going to sit down. They're going to go, okay, so we got Zelensky's 10-point peace plan, guys. What's everybody think? All right, good. We all in agreement. Good plan. Uh, point number one, uh, Russia has to die. Nah, we can't do that one, guys. Uh, so we're going to have to modify point number one. What are we going to say? Well, let's get consensus. Okay, good. Point number two, uh, Russia has to die twice. All right, no, yeah. Zelensky, come on, man. Work with us, buddy. That's not going to happen. Uh, but, and, and you're going to see them take each 10 points, and they're going to work them. And, uh, and come up with a plan, because why would the West do this if they're winning? Why would the West get together in desperation uh, to try and find some sort of negotiated pla- a platform for negotiation if they're winning? Because they're not winning. They're losing. They're getting beat badly. And so you, you, you've got that going on. But here's the deal. Um, and this, is, this applies for both Russia and, and the West. I mean, again, because he's an actor, I keep bringing up these acting things. But um, have you ever, you know, I can't think right off the hand, but let's just imagine a classic TV show. I'm going to give away my age right now, but Magnum P.I., the old one, (laughs) not the new one. Magnum P.I., Tom Selleck is Magnum P.I. Got the mustache, he's, he's, right? So could you imagine like on season five and um, suddenly... Magnum P.I. And it's somebody else who doesn't even look like Tom Selleck. Doesn't sound like Tom Selleck, but he's Magnum P.I. The show would tank. Because everybody's going to go, where's Tom? Where's Tom? We're used to seeing Tom. Zelensky is Tom Selleck. I mean, that's the bottom line. Uh, he, is the, he is the figure everybody knows. Um, the West needs Zelensky because if you get rid of Zelensky, who's going to take over? What's the political dynamic behind it? Are you going to open the door for a Zeluzhny? Do we know how Zeluzhny is going to react? Do you open the door for the right sector to put in, you know, somebody who's more hard line? Um, you know, Yermak, what's his role? Is he going to step in? You know, there's so many questions. And what NATO's looking for is as seamless a path out of this conflict as possible. And Zelensky is, is the guy, he's Tom Selleck. You need to end the series, but you you can you have to. It's going to take three seasons to end the series, but you need each season to be successful. You need people to come to the table and watch it. So Tom's got to stay in the role. Zelensky's got to stay in the role. I think the West is going to do their best to keep Zelensky in power because he's the face of Ukraine right now. You remove him, and suddenly the the script changes. Um, and people may say, "Well, we're not acting anymore. This is we're going to do a." You know, we're, we're into free, you know, what is it, freestyle or, or whatever, improv, improv. We're going to do improv. Um, every director hates improv because you don't know what's going to happen. 
in, in the United States as the director needs to know what's going to happen. The same thing with Russia. Russia right now has, they've already negotiated a deal with Zelensky. It was the one that could have been implemented on April 1st. And the Russians, um, again, I can't speak for them, but I, I think I know them pretty well. Um, I, I would imagine that their current position is a modification of that negotiated settlement, that they're not going to detract, you know, they're not going to deviate too far from that. So one way that you keep grounded with that, with that deal is to keep the guy in power who negotiated that deal, keep him in power. So I think Zelensky... Both sides want him around for a while. The wild card is Ukraine. You know, how is Ukraine going to do this? Um, is there 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 is growing discontent in Ukraine? Um, uh, people are having now. Zelensky is becoming more and more of a dictator. His uh, his, his his number one guy Yermak is um, is consolidating power within the office of the presidency. Um, but you know, what happens if? You know, the number two guy decides that I've been doing it all anyways, I'm number one. But what happens when the general says, I'm tired of uh, sacrificing troops on the battlefield in support of whatever stupidity you're doing here, uh, we need to take control of this. Uh, you know, it changes the game. That If you change the political dynamic inside Ukraine, you change the negotiation itself. Everything that they're trying to do in Saudi Arabia becomes futile. The entire deal that Russia's already written becomes futile. You got to start from scratch. Now there's a lot of unknowns in there. Um, I don't think Russia or the West are looking for unknowns right now. I think there's wide agreement on what has to happen. The question is, how do you get there? And you're starting to hear it from the West. There will have to be territorial concessions. And once you get over territorial concessions, the rest of it's easy. Demilitarization, get NATO the hell out of there. Denazification, come up with some laws guy that Bandera doesn't get to be your national hero anymore. You'll never be part of NATO and there will be security guarantees. That's the easy stuff. The hard stuff is the territorial concessions. And this is why I think Russia isn't too anxious to acquire more territory. Because politically speaking, if Russia took over Odessa, you can't give it back. You can't give Odessa back. So it's best not to take it. Same thing with Kharkov. Don't take it, because once you take it, you're not giving it back. And now you've complicated by an order of magnitude the whole territorial concession thing. Right now, Russia can make the claim for Kherson, Zaporizhia, Lugansk, and Donetsk. Crimea has never been really on the table. Only only cocaine snorting Ukrainians think that's there. But um, I'm not mentioning any names. But uh, you know, the, the point is, Ukraine's going to have to accept territorial concessions. And right now, there's a package there that's doable because it's real. Because Ukraine just beat themselves to death trying to you know, make a dent on that territory, and they can't. Ukraine recognizes they're not going to get it back. And NATO recognizes that there's not any amount of equipment we can give to Ukraine to get that back. So this is a reality. And once Ukraine says, OK, we can live with this territory being Russia, the rest of the negotiation is a piece of cake. And, um, and, and so that's the direction I think we're headed is the West is trying to get Ukraine to concede that they're going to have to, you know, drink that poison chalice as, uh, uh, you know, the, the Ayatollah Khomeini once famously said about, um, about, uh, the making peace with, uh, with Iraq, uh, he said, I have to drink the, this, 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 this poison chalice because he had no choice. And I think Ukraine is going to be in that situation, too, where they have no choice. But it helps if you have Zelensky in power uh, to get there because he's the one that you've been dealing with. It's, if you have to start from scratch, you just don't know what you're going to get. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, speaking of being out of options, because that's what it sounds like for the United States and NATO, that there really aren't many options left, but to pursue some kind of negotiated settlement. It'll be interesting to see, as you said, Scott, in Saudi Arabia, what exactly happens, because it does feel like the U.S. and, um, you know, and its so-called partners, they're trying to claw with Saudi Arabia, maybe clap back a bit. You maybe if there's some kind of way to use it in this in this way to help facilitate 
something, but it does it it, it it and it's and it's definitely going to be interesting to see what happens because it does feel quite tenuous. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next video.